Good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you for coming this morning to open up God's Word with me. Always a blessing. I don't say that lightly. I mean, I'm dead serious. This is always a blessing to be able to open up God's book. Uh, what, a, what a privilege we have that we have it. Perfect, pure, without error. And uh, just pray that we get some help this morning. So let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, the Lord just had me hang out in these verses for just a, um, uh, another week. So let's, uh, let's all stand up, please. Let's read verses 1 to 4. We have a Bible in the pew, page 1541, 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. Starting in verse number 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you received another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Uh, Brother Jordan, could you pray, please? Amen. 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 All right, you can be seated. Now, we're going to hang out in these verses again this morning. So, uh, how would you know today, how would you know if, some, if someone was preaching a different Jesus than the one Paul preached? How would you know if it was a different Jesus? Well, you'd have to go buy the Bible. Uh, how would you know if someone told you that, you know, in order to get the Holy Ghost, you have to speak in other tongues or you have to get water baptized or... You have to partake of the sacraments. How would you know that that's not the case? Well, you'd have to go to the Bible. And um, the only way that you know that you have the true gospel and believe it, the only way that you can know that uh, you have a, if you have a false gospel is compare it to what does the Bible say, okay? And what does the Bible teach? So this, this deliverance from, uh, from deception, it depends upon having, number one, in believing that the Bible is, is the Word of God and believing what the Word of God says. It's, it's pretty evident, okay? About, now, in verse 2, he says, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. And uh, even when we, you know, we stated last week that uh, jealousy has a very positive and a very noble aspect to it. Uh, and I don't know if, if any of you objected to, uh, to that or maybe just wondered, you know, can that really be? Is jealousy, uh, uh, could that be a good thing? Well, let's go back to Exodus 34 real quick. Let's go to Exodus 34. And we're going to just look at this again. Exodus 34, okay, this is Moses. He's going up on top, of, on top of Mount Sinai, and he's receiving the replacement for the original autographs, which were destroyed. And, uh, you know, what happened with Moses? He got all this stuff written, written down by the hand of God and stuff, and next thing you know, he, he cast them down. So God did not panic when he lost the originals. He told him to go back up. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's uh, amazing that God can preserve exactly what he said from the beginning and preserve it in a, in a, you know, a redo, so to say. Okay, he, God remembered what he said. That shouldn't be that far out to believe, but he did. Okay, so Exodus 34, verse number 12. Exodus 34, verse number 12. Let's look at this. 
Exodus 34, 12, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest. That's what we got to pay attention to. You know, who are we going to listen to? What our land tries telling us, what our nation tries telling us, or are we just going to just try to stick with what the Bible tries telling us? Uh, you better pay attention to yourself lest you make a covenant with the wrong people. Okay, you always got to be in agreement with what the Bible says. Take heed to thyself lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whether thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. A snare, like a trap. Okay? Look at verse 13. Here's, here's what to do. Good instruction and in righteousness. But ye shall destroy their altar, their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. Now look at verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other God. No other God. For the Lord, L-O-R-D, Jehovah God, the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Isn't that amazing? Now, okay, so you think about that. So, you know, evidently God was not for uh, spreading Judaism at this time. You know, he wasn't for spreading Judaism by incorporating all the other Canaanite religions and all the other false religions and a little bit of this religion, a little bit of that religion. God was not for that. What did he say? Get rid of it. Break it down. Break down the altars. Break down the images. Uh, when you get to their land, completely get rid of that religion. Have nothing to do with it. Okay, that's 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 God's uh, view of the matter there. So most people they don't even know that you know verse verse number fourteen is is in the Bible. And when I, you think about that, what's God's name? Well, one of them is I am. I tell him I am sent you. Uh, and what's God's name? Jehovah. Jehovah God. Uh, what's, what else is God's name? Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, what else is his name? Um, Jesus. Jesus, that's, that's the name of God. Uh, so what, what, what's, what's another one of God's names? Jealous. <laughs> with a capital J. You know, we, why not just start a church called the Jealous Witnesses? You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know. The Jealous Witnesses. How about that one? And uh, the Lord, he's pretty much saying, I don't want to share... Your love. I don't want to share it. I, the, the Lord is worthy of receiving all the love. Not sharing you and dividing up. I'll give you some. I'll give some here. He wants all your love. That's the first commandment that most anybody can't get past before they get to the rest of them. Is love the Lord thy God. With all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy strength, all thy might. <laughs> you, know, you, talk to, you know, you talk to people about breaking the law. You can't even get past the first one. Loving the Lord, you know. Uh, now, come back to uh, keep a hand, obviously, in 2 Corinthians, a bookmark or something. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, okay? God don't want to share your affection with any other gods or deities or religions or beliefs. Okay? Well, only one true God. You know, there's, ain't, there's not these multiple ways, multiple paths. There can't be because they all conflict. One religion says another thing, this religion says another thing, and you, you can't say, oh, well, they're all truth. No, they're not. They conflict. One's right, one's wrong. It's, it's, you can't have conflicting authorities, okay? Uh, so come to 2 Corinthians 11, verse number 2. 2 Corinthians 11, verse number 2. Paul says, For I am jealous of you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that, I'm, that I may present you as a chaste virgin, to Christ. Now this is interesting because Jesus Christ is going to present his church, his bride, to the Father. And, um, and, and it's like it's the minister's responsibility. Paul, you know, Paul says it, um, even me. It's the minister's responsibility to present the bride to Jesus. And that's what, I believe that's what Paul is saying there. That, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Uh, so the, the idea that Paul's trying to get across is, you know, I, I want to get you all to the place where there's nothing left that the Lord has to fix up at the judgment. The, in, you know, at, at the judgment seat of Christ. That's, that's Paul's like main object, objective. That should be every preacher, every minister's objective to get you ready for the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty high standard, if you would think. That's a pretty high goal, uh, if you would say. And that sure is. Now, what would, what would hinder that? What would hinder me trying to get you ready for the judgment seat of Christ? Or what would hinder any minister trying to get another Christian ready to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Uh, what would hinder that? Well, verse number three, But I fear 
lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Ain't that something? A little, a little subtlety, something small, something that starts out little. Through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We've been talking a couple weeks about the mind, and that's, that's what the devil's really after. He's trying to get your mind corrupted. So uh, here's a warning here that we look at. In a 2,000-year-old epistle, this written was written 58 A.D., so it's a 2,000-year-old epistle writing about a 6,000-year-old event that took place and saying, you know, you pretty much don't have to worry about anything else that the devil's going to get to you. You don't got to worry about much else except what he did to Eve in the garden. Okay, there's like, there's no new tactic. There's no new tricks. No new schemes. So uh, what the serpent did to Eve is what the serpent wants to do to you today. It's what the devil wants to do to me today. And uh, if, if he, will, you know, if, if he will cause us to be, uh, you know, to, to be corrupted, that's what he wants to do, instead of being perfected, like what, like what Paul and like any minister and any Christian want, should want to be perfected, the devil wants you to be corrupted. So this morning we're going to talk about the, the message, the title of the message is Lessons from Eve. Lessons from Eve. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to see what we can learn from Eve because like I said, if the devil's going to come at me like he came at Eve, I, I want to be ready. I want to be prepared and with the Lord's help, that's what I'm going to try to help you guys out with this morning. So Genesis chapter 2, book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Genesis 2.15 And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to sit around and do nothing, just drink a bunch of coconut milk under the trees? No. He didn't, he didn't tell him to do that, actually. He actually said, look, he put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That's work. Okay? So the work is not a curse. Okay? God put the man to work before the fall. And uh, before sin, so work is actually, it's a, it should be a blessing. It should be a joy. But of course, you know, sin, it, it did kind of wreck it because now we sweat and stink and things like that. So there's kind of a, uh, the curse after it. But original, the original intention of work, it's a blessing. It's a, it's a joy, okay? Now look at verse number 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Notice that, that even that word freely, well isn't salvation by God a free gift from someone that died upon a tree, you know, there's all kinds of pictures and typology there. I believe that, you know, we get crazy, the type of wood that Jesus Christ died on was probably the same kind of wood that it was made out of the tree of life, <laughs> you know, so uh, that thou mayest freely eat and salvation is a free gift that God offers. You trust in my finished works, I came down, lived the perfect sinless life, I died. I, I loved you enough to, to die for your sins. I took your place. I was buried and I resurrected the third day and conquered death and hell. Now, would you will will you receive that? And it's up to you to whether you say yes or no. Okay, then that, that's that's where your part comes in. But salvation is a free gift, and I uh, I think in that verse verse sixteen, that's great. It's a command. God commanded you to be blessed. God commanded you to be you know blessed abundantly. God commanded you to enjoy almost almost everything that he made and isn't that nice you think about that you know god you know god uh, god commanded adam and most most look at this this passage here and they say well you know god gave a command to adam and they go to the next part like verse number 17 okay uh but they never say the first part they always talk about the commandments in the beginning but look at verse 17 but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not Eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You got to circle those words. Circle that word. That word surely, surely die. Okay. Um, now it's God. Really, He has ordained that we walk in light and have life more abundantly and be you know loaded up with with daily benefits. And I don't see anything wrong with with the uh, the first part of that commandment. Of course, you know God commanded. Saying that thou mayest freely eat. And, you know, some people, they have, they have the mindset, you know, they say, well, you know, oh, there goes a commandment. You know, there goes God trying to tell us what to do. And, uh, and, and you know, why, why would you really view 
verses 16 and 17 as something negative when God's trying to, He's trying to really tell you what not to do in order for you not to die. I mean, how could that be such a... People look at that like, you know, oh, God's commanding me and that's so negative. And why would you view that as a negative? You know, and then yet when like a parent tells a teenager, you know, don't do that, uh, well, what, what do they hear? Well, sometimes they hear, oh, you know, you're just trying to, you know, cramp my style or you're just, you know, you're just trying to hinder me. You're trying to mess me up. Let me live a little bit. Well, uh, you know, what are they telling you? Your parents pretty much telling you, I don't want you to go to jail. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to bust up your neck and I don't want you to go mess up your life in drugs and be on rehab. I don't want you to, you know, uh, get injured or killed or something like that. And, you know, what do we sometimes hear? Sometimes, we, you know, all we hear is, oh, you're just trying to tell me what to do all the time. <laughs> you know, just knock off the attitude and just, just take it, accept it, you know. That's, it's God, you know, it's, it, God, yes, God is telling him what to do. And we could clearly see that. But he's telling him, what to do in order so he doesn't die. Uh, the commandment is not a negative thing. It's, a, it's really a loving God giving protection over, over his creation, you know, giving, giving man protection from, from that which would destroy him. All right, now, Genesis 2, 18, let's look at this verse. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. Now, all you single guys misquote that, like I shortly did after I got saved. I mis I misquoted that too, and I said I was t talking to the Lord, saying, "Lord, you you said uh, it's not good for a man to be alone. Lord, I need a I need a godly wife. You got to help me out. I I need a I need a you know godly wife. You said it's not good for a man to be alone. That's not what He said. <laughs> he didn't say that actually, and uh, He didn't say it's not good for a man to be alone. He said it's not good that the man. Uh, should be alone, and that man ain't you. <laughs> that man's Adam. We got to think about that. Okay, that man was Adam. Now, you know, you single men may say, well, you know, I'd be better off with a wife. You know, how, no, how, no you wouldn't. How do you know? You may not be. Yeah, so, I, I, I don't know because, you know, you don't know because you don't, you don't have one. Okay, so, uh, Siri talking to me now. Now, uh, another thing is, uh, what we want to do is, you know, wh when we want something, we want to make it out to be like it's God's will when we want something. And, uh, and, and you know, you could say, I just know this is the one that God has gave me. Uh, yeah, but then what happens when she turns you down, when you ask her to marry you, and she says no, <laughs> when you were been saying the whole time, this is God's want, this is God's will, he, he wants me to be with this woman, or what happens when things don't work and things, you know, fall apart and stuff like that, and then you can't say that the next one is God's will. This is the one God has for me because you already said that about the first one. So something, you know, something, something's wrong there. So uh, how about just be careful about saying that stuff too soon and you're best off just praying and working and, and trusting in the Lord that He will give you the right one, okay? And instead of saying something's God's will for you when it's really not His will, okay? So be careful with that stuff. Now look at uh, verse number 18. He says this, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. Now, you know, you know why the Lord made that woman? Because the man needed help. Us men need help. Okay? I do. I, I, I completely see it. I mean, I don't know where, where my head's at half the time. I don't know where this is at, what's going on, how to do... I mean, like, really, it's, it's, sometimes it's sad, you know, but uh, the, uh, I can only imagine when I get older, man, jeez. Uh, I, I need help. We need help. Men need help. Okay, and he didn't need a servant, but he needed a helper. Men needed a helper. He didn't need a punching bag, but he needed a helper. That's what, that's what he needed. And people read that verse like it like it says "help me," like one word, and it's it's not one word. It's two words, and uh, it's a help meet for him. And you look up, you cross reference that word "meet," and it's just it, "meet." M e e t means fitting proper, suitable, uh, qualified, like we're familiar with Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, John the Baptist baptizing people, bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Anybody remember that verse? Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Or how Paul uses it in Romans chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, how about this one? Men with men, or men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in lust one toward another. Men with men with men, 
working that which is unseemly. Okay? Working that which is unseemly. Don't fit. Not proper. Not qualified. Not working that which is unseeming, uh, unseemly, unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. They, they mess around. That stuff's not fitting. It's not suitable. It's not proper. It's not right. Uh, so in here, you know, it, uh, a help meet, God made a help, he wants to make a help meet for him, a help that is fit, proper, suitable, and qualified for the man, all right? Then look at verse number 18, and the Lord God said, or, uh, or verse uh, number 19, uh, and out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam, ain't that something? to see what he would call them. Like he's examining man's intelligence. I'm going to see what this guy calls, calls all these things now, you know. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. That's a smart guy. You talk about using 100% of your brain capability. I can't name every single animal. You know, I mean, really. You, think, you really think about how amazing that was. At the, uh, in the name thereof. Okay, verse 20. Adam gave names to all cattle, to all the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. For Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. So you're thinking about this, that you know you can feel in this passage that his, that his heart is sinking as the day goes on. And uh, his, his countenance begins to look discouraged. You probably can see he's probably getting a little teary-eyed. Because verse number 20 uh, you know, picture this. Or verse number 18, you got a picture. The Lord says, Adam, you know what? It's not good for you to be alone. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make you a helpmeet. And then as the day goes on, here comes the rhinoceroses. Here comes the giraffes. <laughs> here comes the elephants. Here come these ugly looking monkeys. And Adam's standing there like, what? but there's no, there was found no helpmeet for me. You know, what, what's going on? You know, anything in the entire zoo was not pleasing to Adam. He, he's like, what, this... I didn't come from no monkey. I don't want nothing to do with these things. What, what, what's, what happened? And I like verse number 21 here. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. You know why he did that? Because he didn't want no advice from Adam. Adam was probably like, I want her to be, I want her to be this color hair, this tall, this color eye, look like this. And Lord's like, just, just, sit, just, go, <laughs> just stay down there and, and you know, and, Trust, just trust in me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you the most beautiful woman in the entire world. And, in, and indeed, she, she was. Okay, she was. And so he, this is the first kind of thing of anesthesia in, in a way in the Bible. The Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And then it says, In the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman and brought her unto them. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. That's something. Okay, now God, he didn't take, he didn't take part of Adam's foot. You know, a woman's not to be walked all over. He didn't take a part of her, you know, his, her, Adam's foot or nothing. He didn't, he didn't take a part of Adam's brain, because the woman's supposed to be the head of the man. He didn't take a part of his brain. Uh, you know, he, he just to kind of run his life the whole time. He didn't do nothing like that either. But he took a, he took a rib for some reason. And a, another reason to think about that is because that's, that's where you're right out of his side. A woman's to be right by your side. Not, not trampled over. Not to be the head of the house and things like that. But right next to your side. That's, that's, where, that's where you ought to be. All right? A husband and a wife, you know. Uh, not his footstool and stuff like that, but... Right by the side. Just interesting, just like when John was resting upon the bosom of, of Jesus. You know, right, right along his side. Right along that, that rib that he, uh, that, that, that woman came from. Uh, now look at verse number uh, 24 here. Verse number 24. Uh, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. They shall be one flesh. And you obviously, you know, you, some of you skeptics out there, you're going to say, how did, God make a how did God make a woman out of a rib? Well, how could God make a man out of dirt? It's a lot. It's a lot better to understand that you know, because people, the evolutionists will say, "Well, we come from rocks." Well, in a way, we come from dirt, but something had to something had to put life into that dirt. You can't get non-living matter into living matter. 
unless if you had one that had eternal life forever. So, uh, you know, in the, in the matter that you just can't figure out how God does stuff, uh, it just means that he's not some little pimpsqueak that, you know, like, like we are. If I could figure out everything about that, how God did, he wouldn't be a God. He wouldn't be worth worshiping at the end of the day. If I can tell you exactly how he did everything, okay? So, chapter 3 comes along. Now, let's look at this. Chapter 3, here comes the devil. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more, look at the word, subtle than any beast of the field. He was subtle, okay? And, uh, and said unto the woman, look what he said right away, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden. So many things we can get into this, break this thing down completely, but we're really not going to do that much at all. But you underline that word, yea. The devil comes at you with positivity. You know, yea, hath God said. He comes at you with a question mark, the skeptic mentality. You sure God said this? And, you know, stuff like that. And uh, So, okay, now we believe the Bible. Do we believe the Bible here? I believe the Bible. I'm sure, you know, get some head, head nods. We believe the Bible. Okay, amen. Now, 2 Corinthians said, Satan... We just read it in 2 Corinthians that Satan is going to try to corrupt you the same way how he corrupted Eve. And I looked up Eve in the Bible. She only shows up four times. Four verses. Eve, the mother of all living, shows up twice in Paul's epistles. Paul's the only one that even mentions Eve. You know, even Jesus Christ says the male and female. We know who he's talking about. But interesting how God, uh, Paul used Eve. He could have used any other Bible story, but he goes way back to the beginning. So nothing changed with, with the devil. So what did the devil do? He, he cast doubt into her mind uh, that what God said was true. Okay, And um, if he can cast doubt in your mind about what God said is true, then this entire book that's full of blessings and warnings uh, and protections, it pretty much becomes null, null and void because you don't believe it. That's what happens if he gets you to cast doubt on, on this word here, all right? And, uh, if, if, or if you don't know which parts of the Bible that you can believe, um, you know, and you, you, some people, you know, they accept some and reject others, uh, and they take, you know, other scientific things, or, you know, and you don't know which parts of these Bibles you can believe, you're in big trouble. Uh, if, if the devil can just get you to doubt this book, like that you doubt, you know, news reports, and like how you doubt the weather reports for this week, if he can get you to doubt this book, he, he, he's getting you. He's got you. you know. And, and uh, if you say, well, I don't know if, if that's true, then he's got you. And if you say, I don't think that that's right, well, then he got you. So the, the yea hath God said mentality has completely taken over churches. It has completely taken over corrupt Bible versions. That same mentality can be found in... Found in all 450 English translations, that's why they have to have little notes at the bottom. And yeah, some manuscripts contain this, some don't. I don't know. It's up to you at the end of the day whether it belongs or not. <laughs> what a horrible mentality. You know, that's the, that's the yea hath God said mentality. Now look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 2 here. And the woman said unto the serpent, okay, we, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So are you ready? You guys want to know what the original sins of mankind, what the original sins were? Well, number one, you know, neither shall ye touch it. God never said that. You could just read that in the last account, what God exactly, what he exactly said to her. So the original sins, number one, adding to the word of God. And I understand, you know, at the end of the day, Eve could have climbed the tree, she could have swung from the tree, and she could have, you know, she could have rested upon the tree and stuff like that. So she's kind of making, she's kind of adding something to like the roles, which God didn't even add, to make herself look more like spiritual, or I guess, or something. You know, that would be the equivalent of saying, you know, God said don't put up no Christmas tree. God said don't you dare die no Easter eggs. God said don't you, you know... Don't you dare eat a piece of meat or something on Christmas dinner or something like that. It's one thing to have convictions. I understand that. I respect that. It's one thing to have convictions, but it's another thing to... Those convictions like supersede the Word of God and now it becomes traditions and now you're 
the word, you know, you're, you're adding things to God's word that really aren't even there, okay? So, number one, original sin, she added to God's word, all right? Number, number two, lest you die. Well, we just read it in a chapter before. God didn't say, lest you die. What did he say? Thou shalt what? Surely die. You see that? Lest you die. He didn't say that. Okay, he said, thou shalt surely die. So she kind of put her spin on God's word. Uh, and, you know, she kind of she was kind of said that, you know, uh, she knows what God said, but it was a little too extreme for her. And you think of that, you know, just a little bit, a little too dogmatic. Just a little too narrow-minded. So let me, you know, let me make God a little nicer. <laughs> let me tone him down a little bit, lest you die. You might die, you might not die. God said you're going to die. Surely you're going to die, okay? Then he, uh, verse number four, And the serpent, look what the serpent said, Unto the woman ye shall not surely die. The devil knew what he said. The devil was always listening. He's always somewhere around Prince of Power of the Air. He's listening. And like Frank asked a good question, does the devil know our minds last week? Does, does it, could the devil read our minds? No, he can't read our minds, but he sure does know human nature. I'm sure he knows things about you. I'm sure he knows how to get to you and how to work over your mind. You know, we in a way could read people's minds at times. A preacher is supposed to do that. I'm supposed to be kind of a mind reader up here, kind of putting myself in your shoes and trying to think what you're thinking so that I could battle back what you're thinking and what you're saying and stuff like that. But I don't know exactly what you're thinking. You could be thinking about... I don't know, cooking, fishing, hunting. I don't really know at the end of the day really what you're thinking. Neither does the devil, but he knows human nature. He said, the devil said, ye shall not surely die. And this is where Jesus Christ said in John chapter 8, the, the devil, uh, he's a liar from the beginning. He abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh, he speaketh a lie. He is the father of lies. Uh, you know, that whole John chapter 8 passage, the Lord just, just reaming out them people that don't believe the word and stuff. And uh, He's a liar from the beginning. That's what the devil is. You know, do you really think that's true, what God said? That mentality's still around. And he's pretty much asking her, uh, you know, um, I, don't know I don't really know if, if, if she's pretty much saying, actually, I don't really know if God meant what he actually said. Uh, and, and the devil can now say, when, when, when she kinda, he sees that, that mentality in her, he can now say, well, he didn't mean it. It's not true. So he didn't, he didn't start, the devil didn't start out by saying flat out, it's not true. He tested the waters first, didn't he? That's what he did. He, 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 he tested the waters first to see if she was kind of willing to lean towards his direction. And uh, she was, and he got her. Okay. Don't entertain the devil. Definitely not. Okay, and then look at verse 5. For God doth know, verse 5, that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And look at this. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Remember that we were studying end times and that guy in the World Economic Forum right on his home page said, you know, uh, man created gods, whatever like that, and gods will end when man becomes gods. I mean, what, what, what a wicked thing to say, that Yuhari, Novo, Nar, Noah guy or whatever. Um, what a wicked thing to say. But that, that was one of the temptations the devil used here in the verse number 6. And we all know men are trying to play God. Men are try, ma mankind, this world, people are trying to play God. If you don't believe in the, the Lord God of this Bible, you're trying to play God. Really. You're setting your own brain up as God. You're setting your own self up as God. Okay? And whether you want to think that or, uh, or not. That's, that's truth. Now, uh, then he says in verse number 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So here's what Satan does, okay? Once he finds in the heart of that woman uh, doubt about the Word of God, then he seeks to persuade her that... Uh, God did not have your best interest at heart. And uh, if God loves you, well, then why can't you eat of this tree if God really loves you? Uh, if, God wants, if God wants what's best for you, why doesn't he want you to be wise? You know, if, if, if God is so loving and so wonderful and wants to have a relationship with you, then why, why, why wouldn't he want you to be equal with him? You see what the devil will do? 
You shall be as God. You shall be, be wise and have this and stuff. So Satan's work in this world is real easy. Number one, will you doubt God's word? Will you do that? If you doubt God's word, you're, you're working for the devil already. He's already trying to work you over. Number two, will you convince yourself that you love you more than you love God? I mean, that's, that's number two. That's what the devil will do. He'll, con- he'll try to convince you. Do you love yourself more than you actually love the Lord God who created you? He'll do that. Number three, uh, will you convince yourself that your way is better than God's way? How many, I, I believe my way is so far gone, so far out of God's way. I want to go with God's way. But he'll try to convince you that, no, no, your way is actually better than God's way. They're Satan's tactics. That's what we're dealing with. You know, look, look at all the trees, you know, that she could have. Out of all the trees, why is she even near, obviously? Why is she hanging out near that tree? Out of all the other things God did for her, what's she even doing anywhere near this? And, uh, you know, I wonder that. And, uh, you know, maybe you would wonder. I hope you don't. But, you know, I wonder, you know, why, could, why can't I have this one thing here? Why can't I? And uh, why would you wonder that? Because you don't trust God. You're not trusting Him. And, uh, you know, what, you start thinking, well, what's, what's wrong with this tree? Well, why are you even asking that? Because you don't trust God. You don't trust what He said. And you could blame all the serpent, you know, you could blame the serpent all you want, but all, this, all the devil did was just throw the line out there and see if the fish would bite, and she bit. She bit. Now, uh, that's, so what's the warning to, to people sitting in a, you know, Bible-believing church with a King James Bible in their lap, with Jesus Christ in their heart, with the, the Holy Ghost living inside of them, what's, what's Satan going to try to, to do to you um, to get you to believe that, that what God said in His Word uh, is not your best interest and, to, uh, and that, that you got a better way of living and a better way of doing things for your life than what God does. So um, look at, come to uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse number 16. Okay, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Well, actually, what's interesting too here um, about that, you know, this, that, that whole thing about it's, uh, the, the, it was good, you know, the good things. You know, the, it was, what was that tree called? It was called the, no, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you read throughout Genesis how everything that God did, it was, it was primarily good. Everything was good, okay? So when you think about that, everything God gave to the man and to the woman at one point in time was good. Uh, so eating of the tree of the knowledge of good uh, and, and evil, all, all they were going to get from eating from that tree was evil. That's all they would actually get from that Amen. because they already knew what, what everything was, what, what everything that they had was already good. So I thought about, look, if you, you, if you grew up with a good mom, you grew up with a good dad, you grew up in a good home, uh, you grew up in a, a good church, good, good home, good, good, good clothes on you, you know, good transportation. What, what, what else do you have to, to lose leaving all that and going out into the world or something? What, what do you have to gain but just the knowledge of evil? <laughs> you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big temptation. What, what, what good is it going to do you testing the waters out in the bars and out in the clubs? and hanging around with the wrong crowd and stuff, unless if you want knowledge of evil. Because you know what's good. And what are you going to gain from all the rest of that but evil? And that's, uh, that's, that's pretty wild stuff there. Now, the question is that I want to ask you is, what, what do you want to know? You've got to ask yourself that. What do you want to know? You should want to just know things that pertain to all good stuff, good things, not evil stuff. Now, look at, look at Genesis 3.16 here, okay? Genesis 3.16. Okay, it's after the uh, the fall. Okay, and he said unto the, and the woman he uh, wait unto the woman he said I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. So there you go. There's where, there's a reason why you women are a little bit more emotional than us men, though. At the end of the day, there's something to have to do back with the curse. Okay, most of the time you know you hear that men us men are objective. We use our heads. We try to be factual and stuff. And sometimes women tend to get too far off in the emotional realms and. Just operate just fully off of emotion. That's why it's good to have, you know, a balance and stuff like that. But he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Ain't that something? That's why, you know, postpartum and 
people get, get, get like depressed and stuff when they're about to birth a child. And Paul goes over, you know, if they continue doing these things, they're going to be saved in childbearing because you could be saved from what's going to go on here if you, can, if you obey God's word. But that's a whole other thing he talks about in Timothy. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And look at this. In thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, you know. He shall rule over thee. You know, now, we, do we still believe the Bible here? You know, we're going to quit believing it all of a sudden. You know? Now, uh, you think about this is, verse number 6, it said, what did she say? That she, she saw that it was a tree desired to make one wise. Okay, and then, over, and then verse 16, the Lord switches things up and says, your desire shall be to thy husband. Okay, so that's interesting. It's like what the Lord said is, I, I cannot trust you with your desires, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what you should desire. Your desire shall be toward thy husband because you already messed up your desires from messing around with the tree and stuff like that. So you say, well, what's all this have to do with 2 Corinthians 11? It's got everything to do with 2 Corinthians 11. Everything. And what we just read right there, you understand how repulsive that is to almost every unsaved woman in the world and, um, and even Christian women too how repulsive it is that what do you mean he, he's going to roll over me I got I to gotta be below uh, the, the husband and the, the, I, I can't believe you no way and that's like well the devil's going to start getting a hook on you that's what most 21st century women say so come to Ephesians 5 come to Ephesians 5 but before we go to Ephesians 5 let me try to get you going on Ephesians 1 first here Ephesians chapter 1. All right, let's make our way here. Ephesians 1. Let's, let's go a little quicker. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number... Uh, let's see. Ephesians 1 first. Okay, now the point I want to make you is, is at the end of the day, we're really not that far from the garden. We like to think we're, we're way far from the garden. We like to think that, you know, I got the Bible. I got Jesus in my heart. I'm, I, I've been saved for so and so years. The Lord helped me with this habit, this habit, that habit. When you're at the end of the day, you're really not that far from the garden. All right, look at Ephesians chapter one. Let's see here. Look at verse number twelve. Let's get some good stuff here. That we should be the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom verse thirteen, whom you trusted. After that, you heard the word, truth, the gospel, your salvation. Whom also after that you believed, ye were what sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. All right, look at Ephesians chapter two, verse number uh, four. Ephesians 2, 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath He quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show His exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ain't that great? Isn't that amazing? What God has done for us, that's amazing. And look at verse number, chapter 3, verse number 20. Chapter 3, verse 20. And now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundant above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> that stuff is wonderful, those verses right there. Now come to chapter 5. Same God. Chapter 5. Now things get a little tense reading these verses. Chapter 5, verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That's written from the same God that we just read about all those other good, lovely, spiritual things about. Okay? And then he gets a little practical here. And, uh, and you think about that is that they, people nowadays, they feel the same way that kind of Eve felt about that tree. Well, you know, that, asking a question, well, why can't I? Or, you know, why do I have to do that? Or, or, you know, who's God to tell me to submit to my husband? 
who does he think he is? You see that mentality could start creeping in. And, you know, the reason that God warns Christians about Satan is because we're not that far from the garden, okay, as we think we are. And you have to think about those things when it comes to, if you're thinking about getting married, if you are married, whatever, obey your husbands and everything. Are you, are you okay with that? Obeying husbands and everything? Submit to your husbands. Are you okay with that? Because uh, the first thing God, God told the woman in Genesis 3 is your desire uh, shall be toward him and he shall rule over you. Um, so, you know, look, the, the, the reason why God is, is warning you of your mind uh, being corrupted and turned aside from Christ is because all that he has to do is just take you right back to Eve and, uh, and to, to prove to any honest person, if you're honest, that you have a willingness in your heart to rebel against what God says and, uh, and to rebel against the commandments of God because at the end of the day, you just don't trust them. You don't trust them like, like you should. And, uh, and don't let the devil do what he did to the woman there. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not that this whole thing of I'm going to go out and I'm going to attack the devil. You don't do that. It's bringing your thoughts into captive, captive obedience of Christ and what the Lord wants you to do. So instead of, you got to stop doubting God, stop arguing with God, and just and quit trying to justify it. You know, people say this about this whole marriage stuff. They say, well, you just don't know my husband. Okay, you don't, you don't know. Well, Eve, at the end of the day, was married to the worst sinner on the world. <laughs> the worst sinner on earth. I've done some messed up things in my life, for sure. Okay, with some, with some repercussions. Reaping what, re, reaping what you sow, but I never done nothing as, as severe as what Adam did. Caused the whole race of man to fall. So, uh, what, what, what gets me in trouble then? When I don't want to obey what God's telling me to do. That's what gets, that's what gets me in trouble, okay? And, uh, and, and when that happens, Satan wins and you lose, okay? So, come to Colossians, and get a couple verses, run through these kind of quick. Colossians chapter 3, 18. Stick with me here for a little bit more. Colossians 3.18. You say, well, I'm not, I'm not married. Well, good. You can just sit back and just relax for a little bit then. If you're married, you got to listen. If you're thinking about getting married, listen. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, submit yourself, yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. There goes that fitting. There goes that meat, that meat, you know, that help meat and stuff, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Why do you think he'd say something like that right after he said, number one, probably because the, the wives aren't submitting. <laughs> so when the wife don't submit, then all of a sudden the husband gets, you know, could get a little bitter and stuff, and then he's getting in trouble. He's doing some wrong things, you know. So as it is fit under the Lord, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Yeah, amen. There's all kinds of other ways, too. Your husband could be bitter or cheating. Yeah, your wife cheating on you, being unfaithful, stuff like that. You know, of course, it goes vice versa, too. Then it says, uh, verse number 20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. It goes on and on with it. But, you know, some of you are parents, and some of you, you know, maybe were parents to... You have adult kids or something like that, and I think, man, poor, my poor dad. You know, he guys giving giving me money my my whole life. You know, kids, it's maybe little stuff. And then you become an adult kid, and he's giving you more money or something like that, more things you need. It's like, geez, oh man, I, but my dad's been such a blessing to me lately. Honestly, I've been such a blessing. I thank you, dad. I just want to just just tell you that. You know, I love you too. And um, where am I at here? Before I start getting all emotional here, you know. Okay, children, obey your parents in all, in all things. Now, I look, I, I go back to Hebrews chapter 12, okay? And, and God in Hebrews 12 explains to you that uh, God, God knows that your parents aren't always right in everything. You don't got you, you to go there, Dan, read on your own time. Uh, God knows your parents are not always right. And I know you're probably thinking, tell, just tell me where it's at because I'm going to go home. I'm going to find that and I'm going to quote that to my dad right away, okay? Well, look, at the end of the day, it won't matter. It won't matter, all right? Sometimes you're, you think about, you know, your dad will just wear you out because he's just in a bad mood or something like that, but he's your father. At the end, he's, you're supposed to obey him. 
just how that's how that's how it should work. She's your mother. You're supposed to obey her, and uh, so you know you're not obeying them. You know when when they're wrong, even though they may be, you're obeying God because God told you to obey your 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 parents. Uh, and you know people you know I hear this too. You know, well, what if my mom tells me to do something wrong? It's like, well, what if your lousy friends tell you to do something that's wrong? Are you gonna are you gonna get on them like you want to get on on your you know on your mom and dad or something like that? You so just stop twisting God's word to you know like so you can eat of the fruit of the knowledge of evil, you know. So don't don't come at me. You know, people say, oh well, what if they well you know if your parents tell you here take back this shot of whiskey here or go out here's this joint, listen to this this wicked CD or here watch this wicked horrible perverted. You're gonna say no, I'm not gonna do that. You know, I, so don't. They tried going crazy about this stuff with, you know, oh, what if they tell me to do something that's wrong? Think about that with your friends and stuff. Think about that with, with uh, your, your other people around you and things. So, uh, now here's the thing. Now, the help me, okay? So, it's like it said in verse number uh, 18, wives, submit on yourselves and your own husband. If you don't like that, then don't, then don't get married. You, you hear me? If you don't like that, best off, don't even get married. Straight up, don't, just forget about it, Okay? Uh, because the day that you do get married, God expects you to live by that. Amen. Okay, so just just to throw it out there. Now, a help meet it means the two fit. They're, they're they fit together. It's fit for the man to be the head, and the woman to be underneath the man. Anything in the world with two heads, that thing's a monster. It's an abomination. You can't have two heads running a thing. All right, that's 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 good. Okay, it's not. Now look, this stuff isn't about who's stronger, who's smarter. Who's more spiritual? Because we all know who it is. It's always the man, you know. But I'm kidding, no. But it, this this isn't about that. So don't 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 twist me up with this stuff. We're not talking about that, okay? Uh, it's pretty much it's about Eve saying, "I'm going to eat that tree if because I want to, because I think you're going to you know cheat me out of something or something." And God says, "Look, I'm just trying to save you from death. I'm trying to save you from uh, you know running into people who don't trust God. I'm trying to save you." trying to make things good for you, okay? So come to Titus chapter 3. We're going to get a little more practical instruction. Titus chapter 3. So we just want to get on some good doctrinal stuff here, but I want to just, I got Titus chapter 3. I got a little more to talk about here. Titus chapter 3, okay? Now let's look at this passage. This is a great, Titus is a great book. Great book on practical things. Living good, live, so much instruction here that, uh, that we ought to obey. Look at Titus chapter 3. Verse number, uh, let's see. How about Titus 2? I want Titus 2. Titus chapter 2, verse number 3. Okay, we'll start, we'll start here. The aged women, okay, the aged women. I don't, I don't mean old, just aging. Like a, like a fine steak or something like that. Just age, you know, it, aged to perfection. All right, I'm not going to say fine wine because I don't, I'm not drinking. I don't want to put that thought in your heads. Don't... But let's think of that, you know, like the aged women, likewise, that they become, that they uh, be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, sitting around talking on the phone all day, gossiping, lying about so-and-so and bickering, don't do that. False accusers, not given to much wine, I'm just going to sit back, I'm going to drink my box of wine, you know, mummy's wine and all this, like this, this whole thing about ladies just want to all these things you see at the store and stuff about, they got like a wine section about like how women just like to just love to drink wine or whatever like that. No, don't get, get away from that stuff too. Not given to much wine. Teachers of good things. Amen. Now look at this, verse number four. That they may teach the young women. You older women got to teach the young women to what? Be sober. Amen. How about this one? To love their husbands. Isn't that something? To love their children. You think about that. You, you wouldn't think you would have to command to teach a young woman not to love her children. Look at the society we live in. A woman will, will pop out, a, a woman will kill a baby in a heartbeat because they're shacking up with five different men. They're going to run down to the clinic or whatever, abort the thing, kill it. Or they'll pop it out and then they'll go give it to some other guy and have him raise the kid or something like that. You as an as a, as a aged woman have to teach the young woman to love their children and to love their husbands, even more so in the society that we live in. 
We, anybody, anybody got any men, any shake heads or anything like that? Jeez. I mean, seriously. Yeah, that, that's, part, that's part of the, the, the uh, yeah, aged woman's job, okay? So the world needs you, uh, you holy women and stuff. So it's interesting that behavior that becometh holiness. Let's think about that. And this may strip some more gears here, but that's okay. If you are a door knocker, or if you're passing out tracks, or if you're a soul winner, or if you're a missionary, or if you sing special hymns, special songs, uh, and you don't love your husband, you're not holy. Amen. Think, just think about that, okay? Because what did God say here? I want the aged woman to teach the young women to be missionaries, to be soul winners, to be this, to be all. He said, I want the aged women to love their husbands, love their children, and pretty much stop, stop acting like Eve. <laughs> don't Amen. act like Eve. And, and because, look, if they don't love their husbands, if they, if they, the, if they don't love their children, they're going to mess up on the mission field. They're going to mess up in the church. If you don't do that, you're going to mess up your living room. So let's, let's get back down just to good practical home type stuff. You know, and our, our generation is full of people who want to you know, defy anyone who says that they're not holy uh, while they're doing exactly what God told them not to do, okay? And, and then people, you know, I'm the bad guy or something. Preachers are bad guys because they say, well, you, you just hate women. I don't hate women. You know who hates women? The devil. <laughs> That's who hates women. The devil hates women, okay? And you know, you know how, he, how he proves that he hates women? He, gets, he encourages you to follow Eve. That's what he does, all right? Look at uh, t Titus chapter... Um, Five, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So you may say, well, I love them. Okay, well, that, that's good. That's step one, you know. And I seem to remember, you know, officiating a couple of weddings and stuff like that, not being in one myself. I seem to remember, do you promise to love, honor, and obey? I, I seem to remember that. And you get there, you know, is, is God listening? Yes, he's listening. Are the congregants, are they listening? Yes, they're listening. And then you say, I do. I said, that's why we, you know, we say, I do. And you know where those vows came from? They came from the Word of God. Amen. That's why we say them, those things. And How about these ones? How, let me just stick with me. How about this one? Here's the inv invocation. Welcome, loved ones. We are gathered here together to join name in name in holy matrimony. Name of woman. Uh, woman. I promise to cherish you always, to honor and sustain you in sickness and in health and in poverty and in wealth, and to be true to you in all things until death alone shall part us. Please put that phone on silent until I'm almost done. Bear with me for another seven minutes. Maybe eight minutes. What was missing? No obedience. That's 2022. That's the modern vows. Then it goes to the ring exchange and declaration of intent. With this ring, I, name of women, uh, take you, name of man, to be no other than yourself, loving what I know of you and trusting what I do not know. I will respect your integrity and have faith in your abiding love for me through all our years and in all the life may bring us. What's missing in that one? Obey. This is, this is new school. 2022 vows. You see how society got flipped up? Right when, it, right when they start getting... They want to take their marriage vows. They mess up right out of the gate, right off the bat. They're messing up uh, because they're, uh, they're, they're defying God's word by not saying, I'm going to obey the husband in, in, all, in, in all things and things like that. So, and then what happens? Then the word of God is blasphemed. The word of God is blasphemed when people who claim to believe the word of God, they, they don't live by it. That causes the word of God to be blasphemed. Okay? Come to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to try to learn something from, from Eve this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at verse number 20. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. How about this? Let's think about this. Focus a little bit more. 1 Peter chapter 2, 20. Think about this. For, for what is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. If somebody's beating on you and you deserve to get a, like a, you know, like a, I guess a beating or whatever because you know you've been breaking the law and you've been just in big trouble, 
and you got the punishment coming your way, then you got to take it. You got to take it like, you know, just take it. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now look at this. For even, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. That's amazing. Okay, now here, here's why Jesus Christ can go to the cross and die for my sins, die for your sins, is because when people mistreated him and, and sinned against him, he didn't stoop to their level and, and allow their sin to justify him sinning. He didn't allow that. Uh, re re revile me. I'm not going to revile you. Beat me up and threaten me uh, and, and cause me to suffer, I'm not going to cause you to suffer. You know, uh, why? He said, I'm going I'm to commit myself unto God. Yeah, that's what he's committing, com committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Okay? And then it says, verse 24, who in his own, who, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For ye were sheep, go at, you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Now you understand this. Likewise, ye wives. Ain't that something? Be in subjection to your own husbands. That if any obey not the word, also be with, without the word won by a conversation of the wives. So, you think about that. You see the context. Um, I, I'm sure that, you know, people here, here's the situation that I'm sure some, somebody, some wife or whatever felt that she was mistreated or felt that, um, you know, she wasn't, I guess, uh, treated as well as she should have been treated or could have been treated. And then the, the situation in chapter 3, verse 1 is, uh, if I sin against you, don't use that as justification to sin against me. Because then there's nobody left in, in the relationship that wants to do right. Amen. You sin against me, I'm going to turn around, I'm going to sin against you. Then what happens? <laughs> and the thing, it's, it's done. It's, it's wrong. So the, uh, the whole thing will end up falling apart. Now look at, look at verse number, uh, chapter 3, verse number 2. Chapter 3, verse 2. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, of plating of hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on apparel. Now this can't mean you don't fix your hair, you don't wear any jewelry, as some preach, because if it would mean that, that means you wouldn't have, then that means you can't put on any clothes either. I mean, imagine reading, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning, of plating of hair, or look, imagine this, let it not be the outward adorning, of putting on of apparel. So what's that mean? I can't, I'm not to put on apparel? So, so something, there's, there's, there's more to that. So what's he saying? What, what is he saying here in this passage? Is you can fix up the, uh, the outside all you want. But if the, if the inside doesn't match, if the inside doesn't match the out, if the outside doesn't match the inside, it's, it, it's not, not worth it. It's, it's not going to, it's not going to work. And you could, you could just look at all the Hollywood Jezebels out there that they, they get dolled up all on the outside then they get married five times uh, to you know five different men, and those, you know what those men found out that that, that that beauty wasn't enough. Beauty's not enough, and uh, they you know they, you might, they might have looked good, but they couldn't live with them, <laughs> and they get divorced five times with five different people. So the, that's that's the thing with this with this passage here is, is talking about. Okay, and then look at verse number four. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of a great price, which is not corruptible. Now, remember in Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse three, what's what's the devil want to do? Lest your mind should be what corrupted, lest your mind should be corrupted. 
So then you come over here, Peter talks about that which is not corruptible. Something else that will help you not be corrupted. So inside of you, if there is, think about this, if there is absolute faith, absolute trust in God, then that carries more weight than how other people are acting. Okay? Uh, and then, then Satan will not be able to corrupt you because you know who's inside of you. Okay? The hidden man of the heart. That's, that should be exciting. And if, if in your heart uh, you trust God and you seriously want to obey God, Satan cannot corrupt you. He can't corrupt you. And that's powerful. Okay? Now, then the rest of this verse number 5 for after this manner in the old time, the holy woman also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So here it is. Remember Titus? Let's just get this wrapped up here. So let's imagine this plating of hair. Whatever, whatever that means, okay, Plate, plating of hair, okay, uh, put, putting on of gold, get my ring on, get my necklace on, get my bracelet on, get my other bracelet on, get my earrings in and stuff like that, then putting on of apparel, okay, and uh, then making sure that I got a meek and quiet spirit so that, you know, w what comes out of my mouth is holy conversation that that honors Jesus Christ, and if, if you hadn't put on that first in the inside you're not ready to leave the house <laughs> you're not ready to go and uh, you know if, if you haven't put on the that first you know you hear this oftentimes you know I, I can't come out my my hair's not done I can't I can't come out I you know I haven't I haven't put on my earrings I, I can't come out I haven't put on my necklace I can't come out I haven't worn my, my final dress how about I can't come out because I haven't got my heart right with Jesus yet <laughs> how about that I can't come out yet because I got to put on the new man first. I got to, I think about Christ, how my relationship with the Lord first. Let's just, let's just think about that. All right. And uh, we could be all presentable on the outside. But God said, I'll tell you what, I'll move, I'll move in there. I'll move inside. I'll bring you some power if you just get what's right on the inside first. Okay. And, and let's close with 2 Corinthians 3 again. All right. I, I, that's a, a great passage here. The hidden man of the heart, okay? Second, Second Corinthians chapter 3. So before you leave your house, before you leave your closet, make sure, am I right with God? I mean, really. Have I, have I confessed my sins to him, told him, man, I'm messing up. I, I, I don't feel as close as I used to be to you and help me. And, and, and that will obviously make you a decision not to get hung up on dress codes and things like that. But that will you, help you make a decision on what to wear, how to speak. You know, that the word of God be not blasphemed, okay? Second Corinthians 11, I'm closing here. I just want to read this one more time. Second Corinthians 11, verse number 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Okay, so I don't want to be a corrupt Christian. I hope you wouldn't want to be either. And the way to keep from being corrupt is to trust God, believe his, that His Word is true and best, uh, and do what it says. Amen. I mean, it's that simple. Amen. I mean, what, 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 a, you know, what an amazing thing. And, uh, and, and the reason He picks Eve is to pretty much, I, I look at it as like He in, invites us to read what we read this morning. You know, go back to Eve and... Uh, you know, to, to show us, you know, really that we're just as willing to, to mess things up and resent God's Word like she did. And that's big trouble. You're getting big trouble for that. So I think that's a fair warning. I think it's a good Bible lesson that we can get from, from Eve. So uh, God didn't write these things for us to have bad relationships. <laughs> he didn't. Uh, he wrote these so, so that we can have great relationships if we follow and obey what He says. Let's... let's uh, Let's pray. His ways, they're always best. Just please remember that. Let's pray. All right, Lord, thank you, Father, for, for these very sobering truths and just the humbling thoughts that, that we've considered this morning. I just pray, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us uh, just to benefit richly from what you placed in the Bible. 
And Lord, we just thank you for it. Um, I, I, I don't suppose anybody here wants to be corrupted. And uh, Lord, maybe there'll be some people in here that are starting to go off the wrong path. Maybe starting to just be too lazy in their Bible reading and their prayer life and their um, coming to church and just, you know, the basic things, Lord, that uh, just pray, Lord, that you stir up, get them excited again. Uh, just, um, we're just, we're, thank, we're thankful, Lord, for your jealousy. And that rightfully so, Lord, uh, we are not to share our love with with anybody but you. And I pray for the uh, for the anybody in here that be considering, um, you know, getting married or or just even in their marriage, Lord. We have some people married in here. I uh, just pray that you help us, Lord. Um, really fulfill these verses and um, the wives to submit, the husbands to love, uh, and and that the that the instruction about the aged women, Lord. I, we need some good holy women in here in this generation and men. Of course, this ain't just all just preaching to you ladies this morning, but the men, Lord, just help the men and women be holy in this generation. Teachers of good things, Lord. Um, so just help us, dear God. I know these are some tough things to go over, uh, but just, Lord, just please allow us not to slip from your word and think our ways are better when they're not. A uh, little, little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Things start subtlety, you know, subtly with hanging around the wrong people, um, listening to the wrong stuff. Little stuff gets crept in. Next thing you know, uh, destruction follows. And you don't, you're not as close to God as you, were, you, you once were. So Lord, just pray that for those that are saved, that you restore that sweet fellowship that uh, we have with you, Lord. And uh, for those that aren't saved, they don't know where they're going when they die, I pray, Lord, right now that they understand they're sinners. They can't work their way to heaven. And that they have to receive the free gift of salvation that you died for their sins and was buried and resurrected. And that you did that for them. And I pray, Lord, right now that they call upon you in their heart and tell them, uh, tell you that I do receive you as my Lord and Savior and trust in your finished works to save me from hell. So, Lord, pray for any lost sinner that's in here. Pray for anybody that's listening. And, Lord, as we leave here to go to the creek for the baptism, I pray that the, uh, we get there safely like Frank, Frank prayed and Pray that the water may be high enough, Lord, that we could uh, we can get John Paul under that water and that uh, we could have a sweet time of fellowship, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Thank you all for hanging with me this morning. Wow, we're going we're gonna to get going.